Good evening and welcome. I'd like to call this meeting to order and ask that our district clerk leads us in the pledge, please. Pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of this board, I would like to thank you for the delay and your patience in waiting for us to start. We didn't get started with our executive session until 6.15 due to the condition of the roads. So we appreciate your patience and uh, you know, waiting for us until we get started with our public meeting. Uh, may I have a motion, please, that the agenda of Tuesday, March 3rd, 2015, be approved as submitted? Questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. May I have a motion, please, that the board approve the consent agenda in your packet? So moved. Questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. In your packet is the treasurer's report for the month ending December 31st, 2014. May I have a motion, please, that the Treasurer's report, including the cash report, general fund cash report, the general fund revenue status report, general fund budget status report, school lunch fund cash report, and school lunch fund revenue, and expense budget report for the month ending December 31st, 2014, be approved. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. We have some special reports this evening. Dr. Butler. We have uh, two special reports I'm really glad are here. And uh, the first is the Bay Trail Robotics team, who I believe is going to um, give a little presentation. <coughs> As they're coming up, the, the board may remember, and you'll hear about it from me again, uh, this is the group that I just at the last board meeting talked about their, their incredible work um, at the competition and how well that they did. I think I'm gonna hold. I'm gonna stop for one minute. I'm so sorry, Mike. Do we have a handheld? No. No. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Nice and loud. Well, okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are FTC Team Six Nine Nine Six Oncoming Storm. We are uh, a patient robotics team. Uh, however, we have, do have some students from the high school. Uh, our team is composed of seventh through ninth graders, and uh, we are second year team. So then we have nine students returning, and six of our students are new. Uh, basically, our team was created to bridge the gap between our elementary first leg league teams and our first robotics competition team at the high school, which is one of the My name is Jordan, and I'm in ninth grade. I'm Mandy, and I'm in ninth grade. I'm Brennan, I'm in Judged by how many balls put in from the 
So tally up period is two minutes long, and the end game is the last 30 seconds. What our strategy for the end game was is if we had any balls in our center structure, in our center in our scoring mechanism, we wanted to score those balls into the 120 centimeter high goal and then park our robot at any goal goals we had with us. Um, this is our robot. We named it Blizzard. Um, but the tough thing is we have to fit it in an 18 inch cube, which is a real challenge considering that you have to score balls into like a 90 centimeter goal. Um, so we had a lot of different ways to do this, and there's a lot of um, really cool parts on it. Um, on our robot, we have a drive base where we put the cam wheels in um, into just a one sheet of metal, and we bent over it to protect the wheels. Um, the mechanic wheels are a wheel that spins around, but also has wheels at an angle all the way around it too. And when we use it to drive, um, we have them pointing in opposite directions from each, so that when we want it to drive forward, all of the turning wheels are going the opposite way to cancel out each other so that it can drive straight. We can also have it move sideways and at different angles too. Um, we also have a beater brush on the back, which is what we use to score these. Um, it spins and it goes into a, a two um, spinning wheels that shoot up into this top hood where it scores into the um, 90 center goal. This raises all the way up to um, as high as it can. And um, we decided to use silicone because plastic would have probably broken if we had um, tried to spin it and it would have gotten caught and metal would have been, would have damaged the field and that's not allowed. So we um, used silicone because it actually was able to grab onto everything and it wouldn't break either. Um, this year the school was kind enough to let us use their 3D printer. Uh, one of the 3D parts that we printed are these hooks right here that would grab onto one of these goals. Uh, we also have our NXT mount holder, which is right here, if you can see behind the shield. Um, the NXT is basically the brains. It, yeah, like it you put the program the in it and it's and then this is our hood, or oh yeah, hood. We don't actually have an official name for it, and um, it's two 3D pieces that are screwed together on a flange, which uh, balls go up and then it goes out into the uh, Our team would also like to extend a huge thank you to the board for supporting our team because uh, without you, we would not have gone to a lot of our competitions and therefore we wouldn't be able to go to uh, Super Regionals. Um, our team, on another note, our team has also done a lot of outreach and also if any of you are familiar with um, the uh, FRC team Rolling Thunder here at the high school, they do a lot of outreach as well and with that team, with that, we've been able to do more and give back to our community. We actually, um, if any of you attended the buckets at RIT, uh, Rolling Thunder holds that every year. We joined them this year for a demo. Uh, so while they showed off their really big robots, we showed off our medium sized robot. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also done uh, fundraisers and we actually have done demos for um, a YMCA camp, amongst other things. Um, our team also does a lot of community outreach. Um, we went to an after school YMCA program and we did a demonstration for Boy Scouts. We also got the opportunity to go to Imagine IT last year. Um, it's great having these demonstrations because we get to meet kids that are just like us. We get to give them a hands-on experience with our robot, and we get to tell them that if they have an interest in science, technology, engineering, and math, that they can participate in first and learn more about this and help them. This year, that there are four seventh graders on this team. Um, and I'm one of them, and we learned several new skills that we wouldn't have learned if we didn't join this team. Some of them are the, um, the safely using power equipment, also um, building certain parts of robots, and uh, we also learned how to do some community outreach, and we expanded our knowledge 
of gracious professionalism. Um, so, so far this year, we've gone to two competitions, one at St. John Fisher, where we came in third place and won the Inspire Award, um, that's it, which is like the top award you can win. And then we advanced to Pace University, where we came in third again. And then there's like an end part of it where you get an alliance and you like there's finalists and we were the finalists alliance, so we came in second. Um, and now we're going to move on to a competition in Scranton on March 19th. Thank you for supporting us. I was just yeah. going to ask for that. <laughs> <laughs> I had the opportunity to come and see you guys at the ruckus in October. I brought my sons and a friend of ours and, and their two boys, and, and we saw the high school team compete and do very well, but we were also sat outside, and you guys did a great little demonstration for us with, I think, a predecessor to this robot. It has come a long way since October, so congratulations on what you've done with this machine and the work that you've, you've done on it, and also on your successes in the tournaments, and I want to wish you guys good luck in the, in the super regional that you're going to. But one of the things that I'm most impressed with with, with you right now, um, beyond your 
technology and engineering skills that you've demonstrated, which are going to serve you very, very well in your academic careers and your professional careers beyond, is your ability to speak in front of a large group of people. Because there are a large number of adults in this <laughs> audience right now who have a very hard time doing this. So congratulations on the skills that you're learning. And, and please, best of luck and keep up the great work. All right, thank you, Jim. On behalf of this board, we're just so excited to have you here. Usually we have robotics that comes in the summer, but it's great, especially on a night like this, you know, to give us some a little bit of entertainment. And maybe you're here to also tell us, just like, you know, robotics comes in June and tells us, okay, summer vacation is here. Maybe you're here to tell us that the winter is, is getting close to an end. So I'm gonna go with that. But thank you and congratulations on all your awards and we look forward to hearing more from you. Board members, any questions or comments? Right. Thank you. So as um, our middle school, uh, or our robotics team is, is cleaning up, I will just say too is that tonight uh, we didn't cancel after school activities because I really wanted to have this meeting. And also the Lego leagues were working at Cobbles. That's not really why we didn't cancel. But um, <laughs> so my, my sons have something to look forward to being on their first, uh, the first time in the Lego league. So nice job. And uh, again, thank you very much. And just maybe another round of applause for, for the great team. And we'll, we'll give a little transition time uh, for, the, for the robot to um, travel. So next up uh, for our special reports is the seventh grade public service announcements. And I'll turn it over to their teacher that's here and let them introduce themselves as well as the students. Good evening, thanks for having us tonight. I'm Sue Medes. I'm a sixth and seventh grade computer teacher at Bay Trail. My certification is in business and I started my career here at the high school in 2000. So I've been in the district, this is my 15th year. I'm here to bring two outstanding seventh grade students with me. I have to my left, Patricia Holmes, and further to my left, Allie Dosty. They have um, achieved great things with our public service announcements that I have my seventh graders do using Windows Movie Maker. They are able to choose their own topic, and out of the I have every single seventh grader and I have every single sixth grader also. So out of 300 students, I, I choose about, I would say 20 to 25 each year to show on Bay Trail TV, which is our morning announcement, which is which are very fun if you've ever had a chance to see them. They're very professionally done and Mr. Giannetti is kind enough to let us show, show the, the student videos. Um, I have two to show you. These are the best of the best and I'm very proud of my students. We're gonna show them and they're both very shy. <laughs> so after uh, we'll show the first one, we'll show Patricia's first, which is on drinking and driving. Um, and then we'll break and we'll, we'll have Patricia say a few words about it and then we'll show Allie's at that, that point. Oh. <laughs> this is actually Allie's. This is on bullying. Can you say a few words about your about why you chose the topic and perhaps the project itself? I chose the topic because TV shows and movies show bullying as a, kind of like a joke. 
but really it's a serious topic that if there is bullies they need to bystanders need to speak up and help others that's great Mike thanks before we move on any questions or comments for Ben I guess not <laughs> later <laughs> I'm still choked up by that video. <laughs> so Patricia, do you want to talk about that one? Um, I chose the topic because um, when my mom was my age, her mother was killed in a impaired driving accident, and she still gets choked up about it when she talks about it. So. Wow. I, if we just do another round of applause for both of them. Please. Um, thank you. You chose two very, very important topic, and obviously you feel very strongly about both of them. And I think that's a very important message that uh, you have out there, and that I, I'm so a I'm so amazed that you are able to put it into just this very short but such a powerful movie. I'm going to turn to Nancy Bradstreet again. Where is she, Nancy? <laughs> He's in the back. And see if those could be featured on the website or even if those could be shown to, you know, Penfield High School students during, you know, as, we, as we're coming up to prom season and uh, ball season and all of this, because those are two very powerful messages that you have there, and I think it's very important for everyone to see them. We're very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, any questions, comments? All right, thank you for coming. This concludes our special reports. We now move on to our visitor speaking time. And we have an indication that Mr. Jason Tillett would like to address the board. Hi. <coughs> My name is Jason Tillett. I live in Penfield. I'll get right to it. Uh, the Penfield Central School District uh, does not protect students from being subjected to arbitrary, capricious, or simply unfair uh, grading practices. Uh, the, super, the principal, superintendent, and board of education have all endorsed current practices in the region's Algebra 2 trick program at the high school that are demonstrably unfair. Unfair grading must be prohibited because it permits use of an assessment tool that is grading to be used in a punitive way. Penfield should not engage in punitive assessments. As this board knows, one unfair practice was identified and replaced with a new practice earlier this year. However, when the new practice was also criticized, it was defended and endorsed by all. For review, in this new practice, a teacher grades only a subset chosen to be 10 of problems completed by the students. How are these 10 problems selected? Well, I argue they are arbitrarily or capriciously selected and result in unfair assessment. The board defended the practice saying, quote, we do not necessarily agree that it's arbitrary and capricious. Well, if the selection isn't arbitrary, then there must be some rationale for assessing the student based on a subset of problems. So I filed an information request and asked for the assignments and an explanation for how the problems were selected. The district responded with, quote, teachers utilizing the, grade, the grading practice decide which problems to grade based on the New York State Education Department, Penfield curriculum, and their professional judgment. So no explanation has been provided other than that the judgment of an individual is used to select the problems. 
making judgment calls and assessment that have no basis for evaluation of the impact of the judgments makes those choices arbitrary and possibly harmful. <coughs> the district confirmed there's no way to evaluate the impact of the grading scheme with the statement, quote, the district does not maintain a record that details the rationale for selecting the problem for grading. The practice can be shown to be unfair to weak students. And that's shown in this graph right here. So this graph shows the distribution of the 13 million possible assessments of two students that results when 10 of 28 problems are graded. Because a subset of problems are used, the assessment of the student may differ from their actual performance on the 28 problems. The distribution allows calculation of the probability that a student will be assessed at a level equal to or greater than their actual performance. So in the graph, we have two students, a strong student who had an actual average of 93% on the problem set. However, that student uh, was assessed with an 88% probability to, at, at 90 or above. However, a weak student uh, who had a real performance of 65% on the 28 problems will be assessed, uh, will only have a 78% probability of being assessed at a 60 or above for their work. That's unfair. Also unfair is the fact that the weaker student has a very non-zero probability of receiving a 40. That's 20% below their average, whereas the stronger student has a practically zero probability of receiving 20 points lower than their average. That's unfair. If your practice does not follow this distribution, then your burden is to prove the realized distribution uh, is fair. This means you need an algorithmic rule to select outcomes from the over 13 million possibilities. Judgment is not an algorithm. Other punitive, arbitrary, and capricious practices continue. I obtained syllabi uh, for all 2014-2015 regions out of two classes at the high school. From the syllabi, I sorted the teachers into two categories, normal and punitive. Here are the practices that got the teacher on the punitive list. One was the practice just described. Two is miss, miss four homework assignments, get a zero, even though there may be four, more than four assignments. Well, why four? Well, that practice is practically equivalent to the one that, that was halted earlier in the year. Practice three was if a homework grade drops below an 80%, then the student's required to stay after school or extra periods. Why 80? Why not 79 or 83? The cutoff is arbitrary. Shown in the panel are syllabi with highlighted passages documenting the punitive practices. So after I sorted the teachers, I went to the high school website to review uh, the web pages, and uh, uh, I observed uh, that some of the uh, web pages were password protected. In fact, there's this one-to-one -one perfect correspondence between punitive teachers and password protected web pages. Uh, so uh, it appears that since Penfield has been recently criticized for unfair fair practices and that publicly available syllabi document the practices, that the password protection is an attempt to limit scrutiny. Let's look more carefully at these punitive teachers. Also from the information request. Mr. Tillett, I need to ask you to limit your comments to five minutes uh, for I'm, our policy. I'm nearly done. Thank I'm, you. I'm nearly done. I, I, I practiced ahead of time. And I got it to about five and a half. I'm Thank very you. sensitive to that. Thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, also from the Freedom of Information request, I request data on enrollment in the Regents Algebra 2 trick program. I put the punitive teachers up top, I put the normal teachers down on the bottom, and I looked at the starting enrollment and the ending, ending enrollment in the program, and this is stunning. The punitive teachers had a loss of 26 students. That's an 11.4% 11, 11 attrition rate, whereas in the, norm, the normal teachers had a gain of two students. That's a gain of 1.9%. This table documents the students flee punitive classrooms. If a kid is placed in a punitive classroom, he or she stands an over 10% chance of dropping out or being subjected to a disruptive change in classroom. Last year, over 7% of students dropped out. That's 24 students. That's one entire class. Likely, many of those dropouts originated in punitive classrooms. Not surprising that at the beginning of the year, one of these teachers said to the students, if the pace is too fast, then maybe you should choose another option. So why are these practices happening? Let's just look at the district report card from 2012-2013, the latest available from the New York State Department of Education. I'm looking specifically at page 24. The report card notes the number of students taking the exam and their grades. Note, a district's report card will be improved 
if weak students are removed from the program. Note also a district report card will suffer if a district encourages weak students to stay in the program. So in conclusion, Penfield permits teachers to engage in unfair assessment. These practices are unfair to weak students. Students flee the punitive classrooms and in many cases drop out completely. These practices should stop. So this board believes that, quote, we noted in our letter to you that the Penfield Central School District does not have a policy on arbitrary and capricious grading, end quote. But in fact, you do have a policy. Uh, the, this, the decisions of the commissioner dictate that the New York State Education Department does not permit arbitrary or capricious grading. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your comments. We have an indication that Ms. Renee Yando wishes to address the board. Yes, please. Thank you. Good evening, welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Renee Yandow. I'm currently an enrichment teacher at Cobbles Elementary. Prior to that, I was at Indian Landing and I was a fifth grade classroom teacher. I would like to thank the board for the opportunity to speak and I would like you to know that I feel truly blessed to be a member of such an outstanding district. I often hear administration and teachers speak to what is best for student learning and growth. These words resonate with me as I continue to watch my colleagues struggle with finding a balance between developing well-rounded citizens versus a government whose only concern seems to be the result of a test. Over the past few years, it has been difficult to watch not only the level of student stress and anxiety increase, but also to watch a group of teachers struggle to keep up with de the demands imposed. Teachers now have less time to teach core material because of the time taken by the daily ELA and math RTI blocks. Teachers have an increased number of daily academic preps. Teachers now have an increase in the time required for data collection, scoring, and evaluation. As the workday responsibilities continue to increase, I can say with certainty that even if my elementary colleagues and I worked a 24-hour day, it would be impossible to fully meet the demands that we are being directed to perform. This is putting your amazing educators in Penfield in the position of playing a constant sort of boot scoop boogie, trying to prioritize the most important task of the moment. And as a result, other things around them suffer. My point is, Penfield teachers are special. We are one of a kind. We were hired because we demonstrated an ability to be resilient, to be creative and inspiring. The recipe needed to stretch students farther than they ever imagined. A couple of weeks ago, I ran into a mother of a former fifth grade student who will graduate this year. When I asked where he was hoping to st study biomed engineering, she replied, Duke or Stanford. And you know what her biggest concern was? Not whether he would get in, but how they would pay for it. That's Penfield education. The student was not part of the high stakes testing at the elementary level. This proves that the students in Penfield were, are, and always will be more than a test score. We have, because we have the best teaching staff. That's the bottom line. I am speaking this evening to remind the board and the district to not lose sight of what our end goals are. To create learning environment that allows children to be all that they can be. That embraces the essence of what Common Core was developed to do. To increase student creativity and strengthen student problem solving ability. Not to box them in. I think that we can all agree that the government issues with education are not going away anytime soon. However, I believe that if the administration and the teachers work together, we can minimize the effects of the damage that could result from the political agendas. Recently, the superintendent and the assistant su superintendent for instruction had the, um, I'm sorry, had the opportunity to meet with various teacher groups in the elementary buildings. I would really like to see this trend continue. However, 
I would like the initiative to come from the superintendent, the assistant superintendent of instruction and the PEA president instead of the teachers. I think scheduling regular town hall meetings with different core teacher groups would allow the district office and executive member of the PEA and teachers the ability to discuss the effects that the decisions are having on students in the classroom. It is so important during this difficult time in education for teachers and administrators to work together to continue to offer the quality of education that Penfield is known for. I'm sorry. And it is important to remember that we teachers, we are teachers who would not easily be replaced. We always have and always will do more to ensure student achievement. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. This is the time where the board also acknowledges important communication we have received and we have received two letters, one from the languages other than English uh, department and one from the mental health and counseling department. And the, this board appreciates always hearing from all members of our constituency. However, we want to remind you that the board has set parameter parameters regarding the negotiations, and we trust that we will all reach a fair and acceptable agreement. Thank you. We now move on to our student representative. Good evening, Aubrey. Hi. Uh, tonight I'm going to start with our achievements in sports, and right now in sports seasons we're kind of between spring and winter. But Frankie Gissendanner won the New York State Wrestling Championship at 138 pounds, and he was the first wrestler in history to ever win states. And Parker Crotman also placed fourth at states, and Penfield was ninth overall. And girls basketball is going to the sectional championship to play number one RH on Friday, Rush Henrietta on Friday, after they beat Arondequoit 53 to 40 yesterday. And last Saturday, Sarah Jean Curcio, Alex Teglish, Harper Stewart, and Brittany Swarthout broke the school record in the 4x400 meter race on Saturday with a time of 406 at state qualifiers. And on February 10th, Greg McCord broke the school record for the 100 backstroke, backstroke and rebroke it two days later with a 5164. And the record was previously held by an Olympian. And moving on to school plays, Bay Trail is presenting their Little Mermaid Junior on March 6th, 7th, and 8th in the Bay Trail Auditorium. And PHS is doing nice work if you can get it, and that is at 7 p.m. on March 19th, 20th, and 21st, and then at 1 p.m. on the 21st. And next Saturday, March 14th, the sophomore semi-formal will be held from 7 to 10 at Burgundy Basin Inn. And the new junior principal, Mrs. Marsh, is holding Marsh Madness, where if a junior has a 100% attendance rate, passes all their classes, and has no referrals, will be invited to a Sunday celebration on Wednesday, April 8th. And uh, the English department is offering a Stratford experience on May 23rd and 24th, where students can take a bus to Canada and watch play the plays Hamlet and Sound of Music. And last Friday, the National Honor Society sponsored a blood drive for the Red Cross. And I haven't met since before break, and the Friday before break, we had the pep rally, which went very smoothly, and there were games such as Minute to Win It and different things like that. All right, thank you, Aubrey. Thank Board members, any questions or comments for Aubrey? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. We now move on to superintendent's reports, Dr. Putnam. Um, thank you, Aubrey. You, you always do such a great job. So I, I of course, copied you for a couple of my uh, staff and student honors, but you yeah. did a wonderful job. Uh, for my report, we do have uh, the standing student and staff honors. I'm going to mention a little on the conversation on education, which will take place next week. We're going to hear from um, 
some of our wonderful special education teachers and uh, Gwenda Buckman and our SEAs around the special, special education plan. And um, also we'll go to Dr. Sansusi for the program two budget proposal for next year. Um, Science Olympiad. Uh, the PHS Science Olympiad team competed in New York State Regional Competition in February. Over 30 individual medals were earned and we took first place in several events including compound machines, forensics, and I quote, the right stuff. And uh, there's a photo there of all of our team members. I won't go through and read every name, but as always, these are up on the web and uh, just one more reason to be really proud of our students here in Penfield. Staff and student honors continued our presidential scholar candidates. PHS seniors Timothy Dunn and Catherine Yorko have been selected as candidates for the United States Presidential Scholars Program. The program annually recognizes some of the most outstanding seniors in the country and approximately 560 semifinalists will be selected and then a White House Commission will select, uh, select up to 141 academic scholars. So we're going to be following Mr. Dunn and Ms. Yorko as uh, they go through that process. But another two great Penfield students. Our PTA Reflections Contest, I did give the board and community an update that we were sending many students to the uh, regionals and uh, entries from 10 Penfield Central School District students were selected by the Genesee Valley PTA to move on to the state level of the national PTA Reflections Competition. And the regional winners were, who are going to be moving on, um, Amal L. Hugh who, for film production from Penfield High School, Benjamin Kearns who had two entries in photography, David Fanto for visual arts, Krista Kogler for literature, and Catherine Pendleberry um, for music composi composition. At Bay Trail we have Madison Nguyen for photography and at Cobbles Elementary we have students moving forward um, Lauren Castellani uh, from photography and Madeline uh, Blyden for music composition, Madison Long for visual arts and Shreya Bhattacharya for literature. And just again, uh, great students all throughout Penfield. Um, what I love about the PTA Reflections Contest is kudos to our building level uh, PTAs and PTSAs who work through this. Uh, not, not only just four years ago, we had uh, nobody uh, really doing these contests, and now it really is a push district wide through the PTA. And now this year, we've got 10 kids moving on to the next level of the competition, which is just really great. Uh, we did hear already about Frankie, who is the 138-pound uh, uh, weekend winner in the first ever state wrestling champion in school history, which is just amazing. And I just want to mention also Parker Cropman, who placed fourth at 160, 126 pounds, and the team finished in ninth place overall. Uh, congratulations to F Frankie, uh, Parker, Coach Leone, and the team. So just a, a great showing, and I'll um, just continue to watch those uh, go through high school. Uh, NHS, uh, also just want to give um, uh, kudos to NHS once again who did uh, the um, blood drive uh, here at PHS. They collected 112 units of blood during its recent blood drive to benefit the American Red Cross. And so not only thank you to the students and to um, NHS that set that up, but thank you to the high school teachers in the audience because I know students are always running late or missing class or having to leave because of, of um, unforeseen issues when giving blood and eating a little bit more apple juice and cookies uh, before you get back to class. So uh, it is a great, a great opportunity for our students to give in high school. And um, after student staff honors, I just want to make reference, we talked about last meeting, some things have gone out, that we are holding a conversation on education. Uh, for the last several years, this conversation on education, which was scheduled in March, always uh, corresponds with a conversation on education about the budget. And um, if you watch all of the board meetings, the last few board meetings I've been talking to the board and making my recommendation that we didn't need to have a conversation on education regarding the budget because we're in a, we're in a good spot now and we have, uh, we're waiting for some numbers from Albany as all districts are. And so uh, the board graciously accepted my recommendation and we shifted this conversation on education to assessments. And so the date was picked because of the budget, um, but we kept it there uh, because it was already on the calendar. And our title for this conversation on education is Assessments and Data-Driven Instruction. It's going to be at the Bay Trail Auditorium at 7 p.m. on Tuesday of next week, March 10th. 
and the discussion will cover common, uh, cover common assessments used across the district to monitor student learning. So it's not just Common Core, it's not just the state test, but it's really all of the assessments we use uh, district-wide to monitor student learning and help support students in uh, taking that next step as they leave uh, high school and enter that real world. And now we get to the good stuff and I will turn it over for the special education update. <coughs> As um, okay. uh, yeah, special yeah. education okay. presentations there, and I know as they're coming up, there are um, empty seats in the front couple of rows. If anybody who is standing wants a seat, uh, we reserve those for the families, but they've left. So if you do want to find a seat, uh, please do so. <laughs> Take your time. Okay, <laughs> nobody fell down, we're all set, right? Okay, great. Good evening. I'm Gwenda Buckman, the Director of Special Education, and I'm joined this evening by our district special education administrators, Rick Borman, Chris Brown, Joe Kruger, also our Committee on Preschool Special Education Chairperson, Lynn Bondurant, is with us, and this distinguished panel of special education teachers and speech therapists who teach an important strand of special education classes in the district. First, I just want to say a few words about the district plan. Uh, we are not planning a formal presentation of the plan this evening, but all of you have received both an electronic and a hard copy of the plan. Uh, most of the changes that we made were uh, to update the data charts uh, from the state reports and also uh, we made a few regulatory changes that, that happened with the regulations. We also added this year some data charts that um, show the graduation rates and type of diplomas that our students with disabilities have been receiving. And those are by cohort. If you look at the bottom of those dates, that's by cohort. Um, and if you will note, our identification rate of students with disabilities, it continues and remains to be one of the lowest in this, actually in the state. Um, and I believe that's in thanks to our wonderful teachers and our RTI initiatives and other supports that Penfield makes available to all students. That's very important. Also, with your board materials, you received uh, a copy of two elementary parent handbooks that were developed by this, el this elementary staff and uh, some other staff that helps parents understand special classes that their children may be placed in. Um, and, and it's a guide for the parents and it's been very well received by our parents. Tonight, we're highlighting a strand of classes that supports our students that have a very high level of academic needs. They have a need for a highly modified curriculum. Um, and these are students who are eligible to take the New York State alternate assessment. Um, these classes are designed to meet the needs of our students starting in kindergarten. And those students, uh, some of those students, move out of those programs into more traditional 12-1-1s, but many of our students have a need to remain in those students, and we do, or remain in those classrooms, and we do have those classrooms available all the way to the post-grad level. So we have representatives of those levels, and we'd like to present very briefly to you tonight how that strand of program, uh, programs works. We're starting, we're going to start with our 811 K1 level 
and uh, then we will go all the way down through the high school and our post-grad program. So, Melissa. Hi, my name is Melissa Gray, and I'm the special education teacher who works in the 811 language-based classroom. We have a full-time speech therapist that does pull-out and push-in services that include speech group, snack time, structured play, as well as during math and literacy centers. In addition to this, we have three very hard-working paraprofessionals who are full-time and rotate on a daily basis with the students to promote uh, generalization of skills. There is an occupational and physical therapist who provide pull-out and push-in services such as fine motor and lock group. In addition, we have a music therapist who comes in once a week to do a group session. There is also a strong behavioral consultant who assists with behavioral plans and helps to track data for discrete trial teaching programs. Lastly, but most importantly, our parents complete the structure of our classroom. We strongly believe and echo the saying, it takes a village. At the kindergarten and first grade level, the curriculum is differentiated and individualized based on the strengths and needs of our students. We embed kindergarten and first grade themes into group lessons. When kindergarten is learning about nocturnal animals, so are we. Each student enters our classroom with a mixed skill set, so we often create lessons and materials with this in mind. Also, a student's individualized education program, their IEP, drives their curriculum based on the goals that are set in the beginning of the school year. Another systematic method of teaching we incorporate into the curriculum is discrete trial teaching. Students are taught distinct academic skills in a one-to-one -one setting. When they have mastered a skill, it is practiced in a group setting to promote generalization. As a special educator, I use grade level district assessments and programs, such as math expressions and the elementary science program to connect and scaffold instruction to that of their grade level peers. My collaboration with the speech therapist is vital to help teach and foster communication skills with the students in order to have them connect and access the curriculum. It is the foundation that makes the program unique among other districts for students with special needs. Next slide. I'm Julie Flynn. I'm the speech therapist in the 811 at Scribner Road. And communication is the connective tissue of our day. Our students have severe deficits in all areas of communication, including the understanding and use of language, social language, and speech. As a result, our academic, social, and speech, speech language skill development are intertwined and inseparable. Instruction happens everywhere, including in the lunch line, the playground, and traditional instructional groups. Vocabulary and basic concept words related to direction and position, texture, and quantity are the foundation of academics as well as being imperative in our daily needs. Instruction of, the, of this functional language is built here. We develop visuals, social stories, and opportunities to help children understand the expectations, sequence of activities, and social rules to situations that they encounter throughout the day. Our students' need for repetition in order to acquire and maintain skills far exceeds that of typical learners. Therefore, one of our roles as a speech therapist, and you'll hear right down the line, is to provide role models for our paraprofessionals in our um, setting so that our students have the greatest number of learning opportunities possible throughout their day. These strategies include sign language cues, verbal tonal cueing for speech production, use of assistive technology for communication, chunking language, and the use of music and movement to enhance learning and processing of information. Inclusion at our level includes lunch and recess, field trips, and weekly push-in into kindergarten. Some of our students also push into other areas of kindergarten during the day, such as centers, to be able to interact with their same age peers. We have over 60 third, fourth, and fifth graders in our Buddy Up Club who come into our classroom during recess. And I think this is one of our favorite parts of the day. Um, these students have daily contact with our students and are their fantastic language and social models for our students. Excellent. Students enter our program from a half day preschool. So this is their first full day experience at school. We focus on getting the students ready for school by following picture schedules, attending and sitting in a group, walking in a line, eating in the cafeteria, and completing activities of daily living that include toilet training as necessary. We use the research-based yoga curriculum, Get Ready to Learn, which assists in optimizing classroom performance by helping the students to be alert, calm, and centered. We practice for 30 minutes a day to help maximize their learning. For community-based instruction, we attend all grade level field trips. It is important for our students, even at this age, to recognize and be recognized as members within their community. When it's time for our students to transition to the next level, all areas of development are very carefully considered. 
and once final decisions are made, we meet with the receiving team and review all the relevant information and plans to support a smooth transition. Some of our students may require placements outside of Penfield, such as BOCES or Mary Cariola. Others may move to a less restrictive 1211 self-contained classroom within Penfield. Most of our students will continue on in the same type of support system, which takes them to Harris Hill. Hi, my name is Debbie Tompkins, and I'm the special educator in the elementary 1211 plus classroom at Harris Hill. I team teach with Mary Jacoby, who's a speech therapist. To her right are Carrie Griswold and Shelby Sponholtz, who are the speech language therapist and special educator for the intermediate 1211 plus classrooms. As students transition from the 811 to the 1211 plus classrooms, some elements are similar. Classrooms continue to be staffed with a special educator, a full-time speech-language therapist, and three paraprofessionals. We continue to utilize the Get Ready to Learn Yoga program, as well as schedule classroom music therapy and language occupational therapy groups. We continue to work with behavioral consultants from the Kirsch Developmental Center at Strong. The 1211 Plus classrooms continue to build on the foundational skills that were taught within the 811 classroom. The level of demand and difficulty of these foundational skills expands and develops as our students progress through our programs. We continually scaffold new skills and information to strengthen this foundation. We love talking with our students' previous instructional teams and sharing their joys and successes with each other. We utilize grade level curriculum to address IEP goals and objectives using the content information to facilitate improving skills such as answering questions, problem solving, sequencing, and following directions. Content area units are used to increase vocabulary development and usage as well as to broaden students' background knowledge, information, and experiences. The instructional teams, including all service providers, classroom teams, and parent teams meet often to review progress and address issues and concerns as they arise. The 1211 Plus classrooms are true team teaching teams. Our students have significant communication deficits which impact their behavior and cognitive function. The teacher and therapist work in tandem, creating a powerful co-teaching situation. The speech-language therapist pre-teaches new instructional vocabulary to support academics, as well as teaching social skills to promote positive group behavior in our students. The teacher addresses academics and infuses new language and social skills into the instruction and behavior management. The process is fluid and dynamic and provides students with an active learning environment where new skills are naturally generalized within the classroom setting and integrated into the repertoire of skills the students already possess. Hi. <clears throat> oh, is it not close enough? I have to tell you I love our classrooms. This is just a wonderful teaching model for our most language impaired children. Our primary role as speech therapists is to teach and support functional communication opportunities all day long. We employ the traditional pull-out individual in small group speech and language sessions, as well as teach whole class language lessons and run social pragmatic language groups. We work with the occupational therapist to link gross motor and fine motor movement and communication in a natural and fun way during our lot groups. We collaborate with the special educator to plan a day that is balanced and meets the communication, cognitive, academic, social, behavioral, and motor needs of all of our students. The speech therapists are involved throughout the child's entire day, every day. We are able to work on the student's goals and objectives in very concrete, meaningful, functional ways that make sense to the child. Because we are involved in all aspects, we are able to model appropriate strategies for staff to best meet the student's individual needs. Right off the bus, the goal of appropriate and independent use of their speech and language is foremost. We work on appropriate greetings and initiations, following directions and sequencing as a child completes their morning routine. We pose questions to seek information about their bus rides, about their bus ride, what they have for snack. We strive for independence, but encourage and prompt question formation as needed, for example, to seek help with tying their sneakers. From all of these interactions, the, S the speech language therapist is constantly analyzing the responses, noting positive outcomes as well as those areas of difficulty in order to plan appropriately for further speech and language growth. 
These types of scenarios play out all day long within the classroom and into the larger school community as we join our peers for assemblies, lunch in the cafeteria, recess, grade level field trips, special cluster and school-wide activities such as participation in our Dr. Seuss <coughs> Spirit Week, as well as larger community activities like Penfield Buddy Olympics and the Brockport Empire State Games. Other integration opportunities may include the fourth and fifth grade course and band, peer mentors, pledgers on the morning announcements, conversation club recyclers, and after school activities such as friendship club. Social and or academic inclusion varies, <coughs> excuse me, varies for each grade level and is thoughtfully planned based on individual strengths and needs. With the supports of the teachers, the speech language therapists, and the TAs, these natural opportunities have been wonderful for pragmatic language and social skills development and training. During these social opportunities, we are implementing and given the chance to generalize the skills that we have learned during structured groups within the classroom, such as pro-social group, feelings group, the zones, provoke, and game time. Once a week, we enjoy pro-social group with the speech language <coughs> therapist and the school social worker where we are learning about personal hygiene, relationships, emotions, and actions in ourselves and others, and understanding their impact through scripts, role plays, games, and picture scenarios. Another group during our week that provides a knowledge base for understanding social pragmatics is the zones of regulation. It is a curriculum to foster self-regulation and emotional control within ourselves. The main focus at this time is identifying feelings in ourselves and others, as well as developing and understanding how our actions affect the feelings of others. The next stage is to determine tools to help us regulate our emotions. At this time, the children are beginning to transition these skills naturally as the moments arise during their school day with the support and guidance of the teacher and the speech language therapist in the classroom. We love having our daily snack and conversation with peers and adults within the classroom. We share our feelings with each other and are asked questions from our peers and adults about why we are feeling certain ways and asked follow-up questions. This is also a time that the teacher and the SLP can model and support generalization of skills by prompting questions, grammatical structure, cohesive thoughts and topic maintenance, and also appropriate sound production. Social skills training through social stories, social scripts, task scripts, guide the children throughout their day. Good evening. Work readiness skills are embedded in everything that our students do, from completing tasks, following a schedule, and carrying out classroom jobs, to working within the school community and participating in classroom-based instruction. Within our classroom, students learn to follow various schedules to support task completion. Students learn to follow bo both the classroom schedule as well as their individual schedules. They learn to follow schedules from left to right and top to bottom. Schedules vary depending on the amount of support that each child needs. They range from visual schedules to written schedules to a schedule that the student might write given a model. Students work toward independence and transitions both within the classroom and throughout the school. Students also learn the responsibility of carrying out a classroom job each day. Jobs vary and include line leader, light technician, messenger, and calendar helper. It is great to see the growth our students have made as they take responsibility for setting up and cleaning up during the Get Ready to Learn program. In addition, students learn various work readiness skills in both the classroom and through community-based instruction. Some of these skills are acquired through completing pre-vocational tasks, such as filing, sorting, following directions, sequencing, during lot group at the 2-3 level and pre-voc group at the 4-5 level, as well as our cooking activities. These activities are co-taught with the classroom teacher, SLP, and OT. Students have the opportunity to practice these skills through a variety of role play situations as well. A great activity is our Cinema 101, where we transform our classroom into a theater and each student is responsible for a job, such as running the concession stand or selling tickets. We also use a classroom management system where students are reinforced for positive behavior with quarters. At the end of the day, they can exchange their quarters for a desired item if they earn the specified amount. Students also learn about various careers and skills through community-based instruction and field trips. These have included local businesses such as Lanaveras, Target, and Wegmans. During these trips, students practice skills such as making purchases using, using money or debit card, finding items on a list, practicing safety awareness, and observing skills required for various jobs. Everything we do all day long is a basis for work readiness. Vocabulary, sequencing, following directions, money recognition, learning their computer login, counting, 
address and phone number recognition, getting along with peers, conflict resolution, and learning to negotiate in the larger community. As students get ready to move on to Bay Trail, we begin preparing transition plans and meetings mid-year. We begin this process by completing an individual transition plan, including a rubric, a narrative, and compiling any imperative information or forms the receiving team might need to review. We also meet with the families at this time. Students are pro provided a variety of transition activities and supports, including social stories to introduce potential peers in the classroom, staff, and the school and class environment. Several visits for both the students and teachers to the new building and classroom at the 506 level occur as well to ensure that each student has a smooth transition to the next level. Good evening, my name is Kristen Flood. I'm the Bay Trail Life Skills teacher. This is my speech language pathologist, Michelle Landon. Um, well, she's not mine, I don't own her, but I share her. <laughs> I share her. Um, I have the 12 in one room at Bay Trail, which is a max of 12 students, one teacher, and one paraprofessional. The number of a the number of paraprofessionals depends on the needs of the student. So this year I have three paraprofessionals, uh, Renee Avery, um, Sandy Colon, and Nancy Sanders. They do an amazing job and they assist in all aspects of the classroom. Academically, I teach math, science, social studies, ELA, and reading. So I cover the five cores. The students also attend a variety of specials, including music, um, adaptive PE, health, art, computers, and home and careers. They receive, on top of the core classes and specials, they receive direct services, including occupational therapy, physical therapy, assistive technology, speech, music therapy, vision services, and working with um, the behavioral specialists from Strong. We always have the opportunity to mainstream within general education as well. Our curriculum is matched with a high school to ensure a smooth academic, academic transition. The unique learning system is what we use. It's a standards-based middle school curriculum for students with special needs, and we pair that with the LCE, which is the Life-Centered Education Program. In addition to these two core curriculums, we also have the flexibility to include functional, vocational, and life skills. Hello, good evening. Um, the students group uh, speech and language services are provided in the classroom and these lessons are themed around the LCE program, the Life Centered Education Program. Topics include communicating with others, setting and reaching personal goals, personal hygiene, problem solving, safety, getting around in the community. And we're always looking for and planning for opportunities for the students to generalize these skills, whether it be looking at for safety signs around the building or while we're out on a field trip encouraging good manners in the lunch line, practicing good personal hygiene, or greeting peers and adults in the halls. We also build functional communication skills through the Second Step program. Um, we participate with another class in the building, and this program is run by one of our school psychologists, Megan Spencer, and two of our counselors, Laura Donovan and Scott Kazel. Skills targeted include empathy, problem solving, good listening skills. As far as inclusion and mainstream goes, Kristen had mentioned we're always looking for opportunities to um, mainstream the students. Uh, depending on the needs of the students, we always have the opportunities to, to do that for core classes and specials. In addition to that, students are always mainstreamed for lunch, social lunch bunches, field trips, and assemblies. Um, back to curriculum real quick. I have a copy of the curriculum if anyone wants to see just what we do set up month, month by month. Um, to further promote experiences outside of the classroom, we have built in school-wide jobs. Last year, Mich Michelle and I set up a mail route, which is where we collected and delivered mail to the teachers in the building. This year, we have a cans and bottles route, and we go around the building and we collect cans and bottles, we sort them, and then we bring them back to Wegmans where we refund them. Um, the money is then collected, and then we'll donate that to Daystar at the end of the year, which is a pediatric day respite program for medically fragile children. Um, we're always looking for opportunities to explore our community, so going to Wegmans, the museum, the planetarium, local farms is something that we're always doing throughout the year. Our transitions can be very complex for our students. A lot of hard work is put into these transitions. Uh, we do school tours, classroom visits, teacher observations, orientation and mobility assessments. We communicate with parents, and we have lots of plannings and meetings. Um, and this is all in preparation for our students' entry into their high school level program. I'm Jenny Kudrowski. I teach the high schoolers, the 9th through 12th graders. 
Um, we do have a team concept up at the high school. Um, I lead the team, and then we have our teacher assistants who also serve as job coaches for students with jobs around the building. I do have a science skills coach and a teacher of the deaf in my classroom for one of our students. I also work closely with our, with our speech language therapist, um, Clark and Carpenter, as the kids call them. Um, <coughs> and they come in <coughs> to teach a social, uh, social skills group with me. Um, I also have a school counselor that I work closely with, um, with the students to navigate through the high school career and issues that could occur in the high school. Uh, academically, we do start off the day with Get Ready to Learn. It sets us to learn for the rest of the day. We use the LCE curriculum, which is, a th we, I split it into three years. I have the kids for four years, so my curriculum goes over three years and then we recycle again. Um, the three domains, we do daily living skills with the kids and I teach them uh, to manage personal finances, household management, how to take care of personal needs, family responsibilities. We do do cooking in the classroom after our biweekly trip to Wegmans. Um, we talk about citizenship and our responsibility as we're getting older and turning 18 and our rights to vote um, and also leisure activities. I talk about self-determination skills and interpersonal skills, which helps um, the kids develop self-awareness. When they first come to me, they want to stay in my little home, in my little world, in my classroom. My goal is to get them out in the community, out in the building, um, interacting with everybody. Um, I try to build their self-confidence, teach them socially responsible behavior, um, good interpersonal skills, um, building the in independence that will lead them to a job in the future. We work on employment skills um, with the students, uh, teaching them appropriate work habits. We seek and maintain employment. We work on developing manual skills that they could use on the job and different specific job competencies. Academically, I use the unique curriculum, uh, which is aligned to the New York State Alternative Assessment. And it's an online interactive standard-based curriculum for students with special needs. There's three differentiated levels that I can easily use with the kids. Um, they're monthly themes, so I follow a monthly curriculum. And it's usually aligned to the state and transition standards for English, math, science, and social studies. Oh, me. Your turn. Okay. Hi, I'm Laura Clark, and I'm probably the luckiest person to be here because I serve as the assistive technology consultant to all of these rooms and as a speech pathologist to the postgrad program and the LCE program in the high school. Uh, as a speech language pathologist, we really can, my job is to take my esteemed colleagues' work, get them there, get them all ready, and I get, re get them ready to ship out. <laughs> That's my role, is to get them ready for employment. So our social group that we, I co-teach with our other speech language pathologists is focusing on interview skills, role-playing skills for interview skills, doing um, appropriate versus inappropriate communication styles, and a big thing that we've been working on lately is advocacy for our students so that they learn to stand up and speak for themselves, not only in school, but in jobs and in life, which is an important life skill that sometimes our students don't automatically have. Um, we provide individual speech language sessions also to really hit home the skills that some of our students to continue to need to work on, such as vocabulary and articulation. But one of my great um, joys actually is to work with some of the students that when they're doing their jobs. So we get to actually work in real life situations as they're doing their jobs, as problems come up and communication challenges un unfold, I can address them right there in the moment and continue to teach the student how to address them and learn from them and move on with their day. We include our students with as much as possible in the high school life. Um, in phys ed, they get to go with the other kids and they're usually paired up with each other. Um, some of them, if they're really interested in music, we've sent them to music classes, we've tried art classes, we've done technology classes where they can um, build, inf uh, build things with their hands. In lunch, they still follow the ninth and 10th graders are in the cafeteria. So I send my ninth and 10th graders to the cafeteria. My 11th and 12th graders go to the commons. I do have a TA who supports the students in those social situations. And we also have peers that come and take um, hold of the kids and hang out with them and play with them. They'll play cards or sorry, and they always beat them. Um, my kids always beat everybody in sorry. Um, I refuse to play it with them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> We do the Empire State Games, we uh, participate in Buddy Up Olympics, and last year was great. I got to take two students to the senior ball, 
and we went out with some regular ed students. We went to Hangwa to eat first. When we got there, our bill, the bill for the students was paid for by a member of the community, So, and we don't know who that was, um, but they graciously paid for them. And then I got to go with the kids to the senior ball and hang out and watch them dance, and they had a great time. Um, this year, we have some students going to the sophomore semi-formal that I'll be going to with them, and we're going back to the senior ball again this year. Um, they also participate in graduation ceremonies. Uh, we try to be one-on-one -on -one with the students and walk them through and help them through the graduation ceremony part. Uh, work readiness in ninth grade when they come up, we usually have a job for them in the school building um, where we work with a TA or a job coach to work with the students on different skills. Um, we have two students who are working in the cafeteria. They help give food out to people. We have our newspaper delivery boy. We have <laughs> um, mail route, a variety of different jobs that we um, try to fit with the students. When they get into 10th and 11th grade, we try to give them some more job exploration by going over to the multi-act programs at BOCES, um, EMCC. Um, there they can learn and start narrowing in on their job what they like. When they get into 12th grade, they can also go into the FOCUS program, which is part of multi-act program, but it goes for a longer period of time to build stanima and independence with the students. Uh, we go on monthly community-based instruction trips. Um, beginning of the year, we usually go to a corn maze to teach the kids about making choices, and it's okay to make a wrong choice as long as we try to fix it. Um, we've gone to Shogun Martial Arts. We've gone to group homes. We'll go bowling with the kids. Um, we go shopping every other week to Wegmans to purchase food to cook in the classroom. Uh, we've gone to Tops uh, Friendly Markets, CDS Monarch we recently went to, um, and each of our field trips we usually try to go to a restaurant, and we'll go between um, a restaurant where you have to pay a tip and a restaurant where you don't have to pay a tip, so the kids get practice of paying their own bill and paying for that. Um, at the end of the year, we go with the post-grad students, and we have an end-of-the-year picnic and celebration with the students. Uh, transition to the next level. I work closely with um, on our community-based instruction trips with the post-grad program so they become familiar with the next teacher. Um, we do worker of the month together and celebrate the good deeds that the students are doing. Um, I also have the students present at their CSC meeting so they have to develop a PowerPoint <coughs> slideshow and they take ownership um, as they start mm -hmm. growing up. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Pat Dwyer, and I am the LCE post-grad program teacher. And I, it's, my classroom is very similar to many of the others that we've learned about. The, the biggest difference is that the community is my classroom, and the, my classroom is the community. And the majority of our day is spent in that community. The people that are supporting our classroom include paraprofessionals, um, and we have one in the morning, and we also have an additional one in the afternoon to support them in their work placement. We have a speech and language therapist, assistive technology consultant, a BOCES vision specialist, as well as a BOCES orientation mobility specialist, a reading teacher, and a school counselor. The curriculum um, that we have has a, the major focus, actually, is developing transition skills that lead to independence, and we address academic skills such as functional reading, functional math, functional writing, communication skills, work skills, personal independence, and of course social skills. We utilize the life-centered education curriculum as well in combination with the unique learning system. And this assists the students in becoming as independent as possible. We too have monthly themes such as getting ready for work, personal grooming, future living options, <coughs> feelings and emotions. These academic skills and independent living skills are connected and they are taught in community experiences. Th these activities include writing up weekly grocery lists, then shopping at Penfield Wegmans on a weekly basis, preparing lunch as independent as possible at least two times a week. We practice money skills and banking skills at Canandaigua National Bank because each student receives a paycheck which is directly deposited into the bank. We research restaurants in the area. We select one for our weekly trip. We read menus. We review receipts. 
We practice paying for their meal ahead of time. They use debit cards as well. We may ensure that each server gets a tip. We talk about, you know, the different percentages that are required. We navigate through the East Side YMCA on a weekly basis and we select activities using the equipment that reflects one's personal preferences and leisure, about leisure time and recreation. In regard to language and social development, effective communication skills are identified and they are rehearsed in the classroom, but the real practice and the mastery of these skills take place in the actual community settings. When we are in Wegmans, we learn how to ask for help from store clerks. When we're in the Eastside YMCA, we understand how to interact with other members. In the restaurants, we place orders at a fast food restaurant or at a sit down restaurant. We make decisions on the spots and we advocate for our preferences and needs. While in the bank, we speak clearly and with purpose to the tellers. And of course, during our community based work sites, when we respond, appropriately to feedback from job coaches and always try to respect authority figures. Generalization of independent living skills and vocational skills can be very challenging, but with a minimum of two hours a day, every day participating in the community, there is a proven mastery and success for the LCE postgrad students. The young adults in the postgrad program need to be in the community and the community has always welcomed them. The development of work skills and behaviors is the major component of the postgrad program. For our student, it is more than work readiness. It is ready or not, you're in the community, <laughs> develop and master work skills. Our community-based work experience provides students ages 18 through 21 with real world work experience within Penfield and surrounding communities. It has been set up according to the New York State Education Department guidelines. The student, the employer, the job coaches, and I have the responsibility to assure the development of these vocational skills. The student is accompanied by a job coach, and they facilitate the communication within the work setting. They monitor progress, and they ensure that the work gets done. Currently, there is one student working at the Penfield Library and two in the Grand V Senior Living Community Center. The students are evaluated um, using competencies found in the New York State Employment, um, I'm sorry, Education Employment Profile. There are 14 performance skills such as understanding your workplace, attendance and punctuality, workplace appearance, initiative, quality of work, and also resolving conflict. Individualized performance expectations are established on a quarterly basis and then evaluated by job coaches and supervisors. The students also participate in a self-assessment that reflect on growth and then challenges for the future. The LCE postgrad program is just one giant, continual community-based instructional experience. Every day we start off at Penfield High School but by nine o'clock, three days out of five, we are in a bus traveling somewhere. After which, we're back to the high school. It's time for lunch. It's time to change into our uniform and then back into the bus. And thanks to the transportation department, the students are traveling throughout the community all day long. Transition. Well, all of the activities that I have highlighted serve as a springboard for transition to the next level, which is the adult world. In addition to their daily activities, though, we participate in community-based instructional uh, field trips, such as supervised or supported apartments in East Rochester, group homes in Fairports, CDS Mar Monarch, which is in Webster. We've been to the RTS bus terminal for travel training. And as often as possible, we provide the postgrad students with exposure to these adult agencies and organizations so that they are then supported with their transition to independence. As you can see, this is a very busy staff. Um, this is a really wonderful group of teachers. I have to say they work very hard. They do a wonderful job. Um, we are we want to just close our program with a very short slideshow <laughs> to show you our students in action, both in the schools as well as in the community.
Okay, any questions or comments? Well, thank you. This has got to be the evening for things to get us choked up, I think. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being here this evening, board members. I want to open it up to questions or comments. Can I go first? Absolutely, Lisa. I'm very excited about this presentation because I think many of you know I have a lot of intimate knowledge with a lot of staff members in special ed, and um, I just want to say thank you because I know your dedication and commitment. Um, really resounds in Penfield, and I think that's really awesome. I might get choked up here, too. <laughs> I'll try to be brief. These, I love these. So big kudos, and I hope I hope you're planning to do more. We are. Hint, hint, all you others <laughs> back there. We are moving it up. Because it's yep. great. It's really great and informative, and, and you know, we, I didn't have this coming in as a parent, but I think, I think those are really great. Um, I'll let you guys talk because I could talk about this for a whole, you know, hundreds of hours. But I think the advocacy piece that Laura touched on is, is really key um, for all our students. And I actually just started doing some recent work at RIT with one of their support programs. And um, that was really one of the first things I came home and said, oh my gosh, look at really this, this advocacy skills that our, our students really need across the board. Um, and it was really evident to me. So I think, I think that's really cool. Um, and that's all. I'm going to stop because I, I know it's late. And Thank you, Lisa. Board members, any additional questions or comments? Mark. I just want to thank you. That the presentation you did here and also the information we received ahead of time was extremely informative. Uh, we're just, there's so many things that go on that we have to learn about what you do, and that was, that was tremendous help in having that. Uh, I'd like to mention hearing you do a lot to help introduce th these students to society to into the normal life at the same time we have all these other students that are being exposed to uh, your students and how do you work with the rest of the district to to kind of help the other side of the equation as far as um, normalizing and working and work together in society we um, we have a buddy up program that was started by others at Scribner Road and I know it continues on down the line um, starting in third grade our third fourth and fifth graders can come join the club and they meet monthly and learn about different disability areas and differences in communication and affect and um, we send home information with the kids fully expecting that they're becoming the teachers in their homes and spreading the good word there and I think I mentioned we have over 60 kids in our program which is really exciting. It's really grown over the past few years. I think at the high school, I really, um, the kids are just part of it. They're accepted as part of the school. You know, it hasn't really had to be a part where we had to introduce the school to them. It's more like, yep, they're here. We're part of it. You know, you see all of our students going down to lunch or going down to the commons together. You know, they interact with our their typical peers, quote unquote, without any real concerns. And really that's what we promote throughout the whole building and through the whole, from kindergarten all the way up, you know, we just act like everybody else. And I don't feel as though our other students really need particular education. I think they're just accepted for who they are. So that's really a testament to the students at Penfield. You just um, wanted that, oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say Go to ahead. piggyback staff wise, I know at Bay Trail it's just assumed they're part of the program, general education. Um, so within lunch, um, PE, any sort of mainstream core class, it's just assumed that we're invited in. Field trips, it's the core teachers kind of say, hey, you know, this is the, we're going on this field trip. How many people are you bringing with, you know, with you? So it's just, it's always assumed. So it's kind of just. I just wanted to, to share, and you, the teachers explained it so well, but, you know, um, with my time at the high school, there is no there is no issue it's these kids are they're penfield kids whether it's the color of your skin the the disability or non-disability how tall you all how short you are they are all penfield students and you see that i can speak specifically to the high school and having this opportunity as acting superintendent being in all the buildings this year it's absolutely true so it's a testament to the staff because it starts there and then it's really uh, a, a kudos to our students because it is uh, that sort of pre-k through post-grad where our our Penfield students, uh, general education students, are accepting, and it goes beyond um, just uh, just um, our students with disabilities. It goes on with students of all differences in regards to really reaching out and being accepting. So it goes kudos to the teachers, kudos to the students, and kudos to the kids in the program because they're amazing and um, little things that didn't happen before: attending the senior ball, being part of the class, going out to dinner. 
uh, all dressed up. Those are little things, but it says a lot about the program as its entirety in terms of real life skill um, as, as you move on outside of high school. So it's a lot to be proud of and I appreciate it. All right, Catherine. Um, with the RTI, you said, or not RTI, with the, um, I think it's because of RTI that we have a lower percentage of, uh, right. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're catching this early. Correct. But my question is, does the disability go away or is it that the student has been able to integrate that challenge so that they can stay with a regular ed class? I, do you understand my question? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure I'm explaining myself right. A, a student can have a disability, but if they're one of the things we try to do, even if a student's identified, mm -hmm. our goal is always to help that student develop the strategies okay. and the compensatory things so that they can function um, with, you know, not needing an IEP mm -hmm. to get them to declassify them, to get them out of special education and to learn how to advocate and to learn how to, you know, do those strategies. That may not happen for every single student, but it's a goal that we always have. Okay. And if we can, um, I'm a, and a lot of you know this, I'm a great believer in early intervention, and I believe that when we um, can do early intervention very often, the students are able to compensate, and with the supports they have, uh, a lot of times they don't have to go um, and be identified as a student with a disability. Some do, and that's mm -hmm. fine. Oh, right, um, of course. But, but, that's, but that's always a goal. Even if they're in special education, we, we like to... Um, help them learn those strategies so that they don't need special education or they need less mm -hmm. to get them more and more independent as they go through the grades. Right, so it seems like it's about identifying a, a need not necessarily through, um, uh, through being in, uh, having an IEP, identifying a challenge, I, I should say. That's correct, because okay. we, want, we want to make sure that you don't have to have an IEP to get help. Right, okay. If you need support and help, we want to have a variety of ways to offer that to students, and I think here in Penfield we really do. Okay, well, I think so, too. Thank you. And if I can jump in on that a little bit. The, the initial intent of RTI, as it was, you know, kind of one of the requirements of, of education, was to have an impact on the classification rates across the country and in New York State. Rates had been elevated and elevated, and so there was a, a really a concerted effort to put structures into place to help meet student needs before they were classified, um, to, to try and see if there were ways to help students, um, you know, meet challenges without having to require all of the supports of a special education program. Um, and, and as we do in Penfield, um, we've taken that a step further, and we've made it not just about ensuring that all students meet success, but also can grow to reach their maximum potential above the level of the standard so that really is it is the intent of an RTI program when they were started and, and we've continued and really I think that you know thanks to our staff and and thanks to the efforts of everyone it's, it's been a very effective program yeah, for it us de it definitely seems so and thanks for the clarification appreciate that Barb <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Lisa. Sorry, it's me again. I have a question that I remembered, but first I also wanted to, to your point, um, and really mention that we have a very strong collaboration in Penfield that I think um, our administrators and staff is proud of with our SEPTA parent group, and they do a nice job of integrating, and I know some of the teachers this year kind of came in to do a friendship club that we started at Harris Hill many years ago, and it's in all the elementary buildings that works on sort of that integration piece <clears throat> Excuse me. So I just wanted to mention that because I think um, when I had a leadership role in SEPTA, I had other districts actually email me and say, oh, my gosh, how do you do that there? And, and so I think that's something um, to speak to Penfield staff and administrators and the collaboration between parents that doesn't happen in other districts. So I wanted to point that out. The other quick question I had for you guys um, is I noticed that we were talking a lot about work skills at the early age, like three through fifth grade and that surprised me a little bit um, which I don't I think that's great but I also was under the impression that a lot of times we're not choosing that alternate assessment for some of these kids until we get into some of the older grades um, because it's my understanding and I could be wrong that sometimes that that track if if you're on that track you can't go back to the regents track is that correct and I was just curious you know I'm, I'm sure it's very individual but but how those decisions are 
made and and those kinds of because when you're really young you probably can't necessarily make that decision right does that make well, sense? It is a, it's a very individualized decision and made very carefully um, between our teams and our parents working together. Um, when, and that conversation usually comes about around third grade when we start looking at the need to take state assessments and trying to assess um, you know, the student's ability to, to do those state assessments or not. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I mentioned in, uh, in the beginning that the strand of classes that we're talking about here, those, the students in this strand of classes um, generally, for the most part, are on the New York State alternate assessment. And we, we don't identify a lot of students. It's a small population, but for some students, um, they are identified a little earlier for that, um, for that need. Do you want to say anything else about that? <clears throat> Excuse me. When they talk about life skills at, at our level, we're talking just functional, um, working in the home, having a chore in the home, having chores, and, and being a part of the, the larger in-class community and the, and the larger school community, um, calendar helper, um, you know, mail carrier, things things again that they can equate what they do so they even have a, a larger understanding of the mail carrier in the greater community again the children that we're working with are are um are, are most um language impaired children um that we have and so they come to us with um certainly an expansive background but but we are also there to help um teach them all that we can teach them and and wow that's a huge huge thing we're, we're looking to do. Um, so when we talk about life skills, we, we just mean daily life skills, really tying shoes and getting dressed and, and, and toileting and washing hands. I mean, it, it, starts, it starts with that. We do lock group and we do cooking, but it also means that they have to help clean up. So, so again, when we talk about life skills, it's, it's those types of life skills at, at our younger grades. Um, sequencing, everything involves sequencing as we grow up. Again, even um, one of my examples was just, you know, following a routine of what you do when you come in. You don't just walk in and sit down, you know. There's taking off clothes and hanging up and putting your folder in this bin and, and marking your name on the snack in that bin and going in um, here and signing in lunch. So all of those life skills. So um, that's a great question because I think sometimes we do use that term maybe a little too loosely or, or we don't identify it enough. I just wanted to say that prior to working for Penfield, I've been for Penfield seven years, I had the opportunity to work in other agencies and I worked as a consultant in many, many roles. And um, I've had an opportunity to work in most districts in Monroe County in these types of programs, consulting to them. And this is by far the best. And when I would go to other districts, I would talk about Penfield's programs. And they would ask me about what, what do other districts do? And I'm like, well, I don't know about other districts, but Penfield does this. So when an opportunity came to work for Penfield, I jumped on it because I knew this was the only district I wanted to work for. Um, this is really an exceptional, exceptional program. And just one more thing along the lines of, of life skills. Um, it encompasses so much if you look at it in, in a broad spectrum, but at its nuts and bolts, it's teaching a child how to be responsible for a variety of things, how to be responsible for their routine and hanging up their coats, how to be responsible for their work. And you teach them to be responsible, and then you give them that responsibility, which is very empowering. So sometimes it helps to stay, take a step back and not look at it as broadly, but just you're teaching responsibility, and then you are giving the responsibility to them. Mark? I guess, you know, Monroe County school districts are, are all very good districts. So how did we evolve into, into being, you know, amongst your peers being considered exceptional, having an exceptional program? Go ahead. 12 years ago, Gwenda Buckman came to us and said, I want to start this program. <laughs> and with a four month old at home and three kids on board, we started the program. And those two little guys that you saw at the beginning mm -hmm. and at the end, yep. those were our first crew. Our and first it has evolved and we've, <coughs> we've made a lot of mistakes along the way. We've learned a lot from our families and from our students along the way and from each other. Um, but I'm pretty proud to be sitting up here and look around at what we've done. 
It's pretty cool. Thank you. It's you guys. You guys, you guys make it work. <laughs> it was a vision. Any additional questions or comments? All right. No. Thank you. This was a great presentation. We really appreciate all that you do Thank and you. all the work with our students and our families. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you for giving us all the time to explain our program. Really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> So we've had uh, two different presentations where um, the board members in the community may have been brought to tears. I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Sansusi <laughs> and hope that we, 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 don't, we don't have any tears in this next part of the so con Continuing the tradition. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, but want to, uh, tonight's presentation, uh, our, our uh, uh, regularly scheduled budget presentation for tonight uh, has to do with the, most appropriately, I think, the uh, instructional budget. So um, I, I'm just going to remind the folks who don't always attend, I guess, that, um, that we always begin our, our, our budget presentations with a look at program, with a look at um, at the goals that the board's established for this year and, and for the future, uh, those goals having to do with academic achievement, excellence, uh, partnerships, and fiscal responsibility. And certainly tonight, our presentations have had uh, an awful lot to do with emphasizing um, our academic achievement and our excellence. Um, we started the budget process in January, and we're continuing to work our way through um, through that, so we've had budget presentations, uh, both meetings in January and February. Tonight uh, is um, what we in shorthand call the second instructional presentation or, 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 or program two, the second portion of our instructional program. Um, and really what we mean by that is that our last meeting, if you'll recall, we covered special education, the special areas, guidance counselors, um, school psychologists, social workers, instructional supports, but not really um, the necessarily the core of the regular instructional program. So that's tonight's uh, work. So we'll cover regular school teaching, occupational education, libraries, computer services, and also included uh, and this is clubs and sports. Um, it's, the, it's the single largest component of our, our budget, the way we split it up. You see it composes 31% uh, of the entire budget. Um, and, it's, and that portion's going up 2.3%. Uh, That's um, 626,000, so about a $600,000 increase on a $27 million budget is 2.3%. We'll come back to this as we as we move along, but in terms of significant changes, um, we're not proposing any uh, significant staffing increases. Uh, if you'll notice the FTE counts and the detailed sheets that you have with regard to uh, staffing, essentially it's unchanged from budget uh, to this year and from actual to this year. There's you know tenths of a uh, of a of an FTE of change here and there as programs have shifted and moved. Um, we're including, uh, as we have for many years, uh, three FTE unallocated positions. So those are three uh, positions that we budget uh, pending schedule, uh, seeing how the schedule works out at Bay Trail, the high school, and also our elementary school enrollments. Um, the other significant change that's included in this budget is we include computers. Um, and this is the second year of an increased allocation for computer replacement. So we uh, have been working to get to a five to seven year, depending on the particular item, uh, replacement schedule for our infrastructure over the course of the last 10 years. Um, that computer infrastructure has grown uh, dramatically as we've implemented initiatives for smart boards, for laptop carts, uh, for uh, um, um, laptops in the, in the classrooms. Um, so, and we really need to support that on an ongoing basis. So that's included here. We'll, I'll touch on that as we move along. And you have lots of detail about that in your packet. Um, also included uh, in this budget is the, is the uh, interscholastic athletics component of the budget. Uh, Mr. Shambo is in the audience if you have any questions about this as well. But uh, the only significant change there is uh, the elimination of an alpine skiing program. 
um, and the um, essentially reallocation of some of that funding uh, to support an assistant coach for winter track. And this really has to do with student enrollment um, driven by uh, the numbers of students in the program. Alpine, the skiing program has declined over time and track has grown. So uh, just appropriate to recognize that change. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but let's take a look at how that program looks in terms of, um, of, of those components. So if we split our $27.9 million instructional budget up into the, the areas, the functional areas, you can see that the lion's share of this is in regular instruction. I just uh, spent some time talking about interscholastic athletics, but you can see it's a tiny portion of, the, of this overall uh, portion of the budget, libraries, occupational education, curricular, the clubs, um, computer assisted. Really, this budget is really about regular education over about $24 million worth of the $27 million. Um, if you split it up a different way um, and, and just look at that rather than what we spend it on, where we spend it, and this shouldn't be any surprise to any of you. This has been true of the other previous budget presentations, but I think it's even more dramatic here. We spend it on salaries. So of that $27 million, um, that first and tallest set of bars are certified salaries, so that's uh, s essentially instructional salary, salaries for teachers, and you see uh, salaries non-certified uh, is the next largest group. So the rest of the tiny bars um, are the other items that we often spend a lot of time talking about, but really I think if you take a step back aren't consequential uh, in the budget. So things like equipment, textbooks, software, travel, uh, summer school, charter schools, contractual materials and supplies, they're important. Uh, but really, um, again, the, this budget, uh, as so many other components of the budget, but particularly the instructional program driven by staffing. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time and, and kind of walk through and drill down a little bit on the salary component and talk a little bit about where we spend that money. So uh, that's about $24 million. Uh, if you will, in certified salaries. So let's take a look. Um, I'm sorry, $22 million, I should say, of certified salaries. Let's take a look at um, what we spend that on. Um, and once again, it's, this is all salaries now. We're just looking at the salary component. Once again, it's general education. So you see some salaries for uh, the other areas of the budget, but really it's general education. Um, so let's take a look at it continue working our way down and take a look at general education, that 20, about $21 million worth. District-wide, uh, it would split out this way. Um, you know, elementary, middle, high school, and some district-wide uh, components of the budget. But what does that really mean? If we split, if we take a step back and rather than looking at it where we spend it, again, what we spend it on, you can see here um, the various programs um, and some, and I think this does speak to um, our priorities and, and the choices that we've made. So um, that district-wide includes substitute salaries, a few district-wide positions, uh, predominantly the substitute budget. K-6 classroom teachers are the single largest category. That's really what you would expect. And then you get into the secondary uh, teachers that are categorized by program. So English, the core groups, English, math, science, and social studies, next largest, reading, um, music, a significant program, and PE. And you see also the other programs here, reading as well, foreign language enrichment, um, and so on. So once again, um, as we've drilled down, this program's about, about um, the, the whole budget's about instruction. Uh, within instruction, really, that means people, um, and within, and really, that means classroom teachers. So, um, you, I, I hope that that's been um, fairly well demonstrated. And as you can see, there's no, been no dramatic changes or increases in any of those categories. This is a, a, a budget moving forward without significant um, changes. In terms of progress to date, uh, just stepping back a little bit. This is where we're at. So um, you can see we only have two more budget presentations left to go. Um, Gwenda and I actually have been working hard on the BOCES budget, so we'll be presenting that at the next 
uh, board meeting. After that, it's uh, the benefits budget, really health, Social Security, retirement, disability, and so on, workers' compensation in support of all the previous programs. And with that, uh, we'll have a budget. Unfortunately, one of the, the things we're struggling with a bit this year is that we need a revenue budget to match our expenditure budget, um, and we're still in sort of a waiting mode uh, as the state legislature works its way through their process. So it's a very unusual year, um, but, uh, but we are, with every passing um, board meeting and with every week that goes by, we do learn a little bit. So right now, one of the, in your agenda later tonight is uh, the establishment of our tax levy limit or our tax cap for this upcoming year. Um, I'll talk about that in just a second, but before I get there, I wanted to, to, to provide a little bit of history on where we've been in that regard. So over the past seven years, our um, tax levy has averaged just under 2%. So a 2% tax cap, if you will. Um, our history predates that um, with some restraint uh, in spending. For this upcoming year, the factors that go into the calculation are growth in the community of new, um, new um, assessment based on new construction of about um, a third of 1%. Um, allowable levy growth, that's the amount the levy can grow based on the rate of inflation or 2%, whichever is less. You can see the rate of inflation is 1.6%. Um, so we're held to that growth in the formula of 1.6%. Um, I think the key, the key fact that we need to recognize here is that the design of that formula is intended to restrain the growth of school spending below the, always below the rate of inflation because the calculation is based on 2% or the rate of inflation, whichever is less. So you can see back in 12-13 uh, when the rate of inflation was 3%, we used 2. 2.1, we used 2. 1.46, we used 1.46. That'll continue over time unless there's change in the formula. It's intended really to squeeze and restrain school spending as it moves forward. This is what our, the revised calculation looks like. Um, if you had perfect memory, you would remember that, that it's slightly different than the one I presented at the last board meeting. We had some tweaks and changes with regard to estimates of our upcoming year payment in lieu of tax schedule. Um, I've, I've uh, made those amendments to the budget. This is our best estimate going forward. So tonight's agenda will establish the uh, levy at two point, uh, the maximum levy, not necessarily that that will be our levy. This is simply the establishment of the cap. We, we cannot go beyond this without a super majority vote. So um, 2.41%. Next steps as we move forward um, are uh, to finish that BOCES cost analysis. I have a meeting scheduled on the 4th uh, later this week to talk about state aid to try and uh, learn a little bit more about um, what our future might hold there. We're continuing to work on enrollment program and staffing and I'm gathering assessment information for uh, eventually a revenue budget and some uh, tax, um, some tax, um, um, projections with regard to the rate increase. Um, in terms of upcoming work, um, we have the board has, uh, in, well, I'll gather information and hopefully at that meeting later this week, the board has a work session coming up the week following. Uh, then we'll begin with uh, BOCES budget review. April 1st is the deadline for the state to adopt its budget. Um, I have no reason to believe that won't happen. Um, it's very for many years, it wasn't true. Um, you know, we went through a lot of years of no state budget uh, by the 1st of April. Um, but this governor's track record has been that it's very important to him for an on-time budget. Um, I expect that to, that a recent trend to continue. We just at this point don't know what it cont what it will contain. As you know, the governor's linked state aid. Uh, to reforms in teacher, the teacher evaluation process. Um, he's uh, not backed off on that and continued to, to press forward with that. Uh, but I think Albany is a little bit distracted at this point with ethics reform as they struggle with uh, some of that. So um, it's sort of a messy year um, if you're a handicapper of this process. And um, at this point we have 
even in the years, the thing that makes this so unusual is in the years when there was no state budget um, adopted, we at least had estimates. We had a governor's estimate. We had legislative estimates. We had, um, you know, projections by the Educational Conference Board. This year, there's really nothing. So um, we'll have a compressed time frame for decision making as we move along, uh, but we think the groundwork we've established is good. We think we're in uh, as good a place as we can be to be able to wrestle with that. So um, more to come. All that will end. We will adopt a budget uh, because we don't have the luxury of not doing so. Um, and our, our hearing dates have been established. So uh, May 5th, uh, is the last formal presentation of the budget. It will have been previously adopted by then, uh, but the hearing, uh, which is uh, the last formal presentation of it in the three-part format, um, is on May 5th. Uh, that's followed on May 19th by the vote uh, and the election of new board members uh, from six to nine at the high school. Um, there's lots of information on this, including video and, and all of the documentation posted on the web. So, does the board have any questions? Thank you, Mark. Board members, questions or comments? Okay, yes, I do have a question. <laughs> um, regarding the uh, cut with the Alpine uh, ski team, has this been communicated to the boosters, to the parents, to the current team? Pete, would you mind? Hello, Pete. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as far as uh, being communicated to the boosters, the parents, or the ski team, it has not met today with Rich Waite, who is the coach. Um, he and I have talked uh, regularly about our numbers issues. Um, Rich is aware of the fact that we have a plan to combine with Webster next year to allow our kids to have an opportunity to ski, but based on the number of students we had that completed the season, which ended up being three, we had six total on the team. It just didn't seem fiscally responsible to continue down the path that we're in. Program without busing, without transportation, which is a huge part of this because we have to go to Bristol for races and we go to Brantling every day for training, is about $17,000. Um, and if you maybe doubled that because of the transportation, it's a significant amount of money to uh, make this happen. Um, we have opportunities to allow the kids that are in the program now to participate. I've reached out to Webster. They're willing to absorb our, our kids and we can continue to offer the opportunity to them in another avenue at a significantly reduced rate. Thank you. I appreciate the explanations. I think it would be important for the community to know how many kids are affected exactly and what is the cost savings there and also that we have an o another opportunity with Webster because I'm guessing after tonight is when people are going to find out uh, that we're cutting the team. So, um, you know, and as you know, this is always a topic of a lot of controversy and, uh, you know, on the part of the parents of those athletes and the athletes themselves. So I think it's very important that we communicate with them appropriately about it. So. I, I agree, and there's not too many directors that would want to come to a board and say, hey, we want to drop something. It would be the opposite. I want to come here and ask you how we can add some things. And to that vein, I want to say that uh, Rich and I worked on a, a, a potential plan today to maybe come back to this group within two years and ask for the reestablishment of a, of a program. Uh, which might be more viable at that time, but right now it's not. Okay, thank you, Mark. I just want to ask, is the, the trend of participation in alpine skiing something we see at the other districts as well, or is Penfield kind of unique in this? Yes, uh, the league in general is, is not healthy with numbers. Um, if you were here on Monday afternoon, you'd see three uh, charter buses leave the building with kids very excited about skiing, but it's not uh, structured skiing. It's it's free skiing, which seems to be the trend. And uh, we, as high schools, uh, compete with something called Eastern Racing. Eastern Racing would be akin to uh, um, Ontario Junior Hockey to high school hockey. It, it's high school skiing is seen as the lesser child in this case. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Pete, and thanks for staying so late. You know to oh. answer. It, well, luckily we had two games canceled tonight. They're on tomorrow night. <laughs> Can I ask a question? 
Sure. Um, well, we spoke to a reduction. Uh, there was also a request there for an addition. Um, is, is there any indication that that is something? But the budget that as presented includes that addition. So. It does. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. As you know, no one is going to complain about an addition, but, you know. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> well, <laughs> true. I think just, just on that note, Pete, because you'd mentioned, and I don't know if you have numbers um, on how the winter track team has grown. I know we talked briefly around around uh, estimated numbers there, but it's, it's a large number of kids. I was, I was surprised when I heard how many we have. I don't it's, know if you know. It's grown to over 120 children right now. Uh, right now we're managing that with four total adults, and you're talking about a multitude of events that require specialization. Uh, I don't think we want to let the pole vaulters go and then leave to go someplace else, so we really need uh, that extra person for, for just the sheer numbers. Yeah, it's just that change in terms of a, of a down, uh, sort of a down in alpine skiing, but the number of our winter track kids and just continuing to increase uh, says a lot, again, about our athletics programs mm -hmm. and what we can offer students, so that's good to see. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Board members, we are now on page three of your agenda with board business. Under facilities, we have a secret resolution for the May 19th, 2015 capital project vote. In the past, the State Education Department acted as lead agency and was responsible for making the determination regarding the potential environmental impact of school construction project. The state has shifted this responsibility to the local school district. In this case, the district will be requesting voter approval of a capital project for partial roofing replacements at Harris Hill, Scribner, and Bay Trail, abatement of asbestos ceiling tile at the high school, replacement of cooling systems in data closets through the district, cabinet and counter replacements at Scribner, exterior door replacements at Indian Landing. The anticipated budget for this work is approximately $2,885,000. A resolution authorizing this project will be presented to the voters on May 19th. The full uh, text of the resolution is in the agenda, board members. I am not going to read all of it. And for anybody who wishes to see it, it is on uh, the website also and available in this agenda. Um, this resolution that we're going to call a vote for now will take effect immediately. Um, Marsha, would you want to call uh, the vote, please? Mrs. Dean? Aye. Um, I'm sorry, we need a motion first. So okay. may I have a motion, please? Motion. For, to accept the resolution. John is first and uh, seconded by Mark. Thank you. Sorry about that. Mrs. Rutan? Aye. Mrs. Babiars? Aye. Mr. Alec? Aye. Mrs. Chidzi? Mr. Piper. Aye. Aye. Thank you. So the resolution passes. Seven. All right. Scribner uh, roof and bait trail gym renovation change orders. You have a series of change orders in your agenda. They have all been reviewed by and are supported by the architect Victor Maselli, project manager Gary Huffman, clerk of the works Alan McNiff, and assistant superintendent for business Mark Sensusi. May I have a motion, please, that the change orders in your agenda be approved? So moved. Questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. Adoption of a tax levy limit. Chapter 97 of the laws of 2011 enacted by the state legislature and the governor established the property tax cap on the amount that a school district's property tax levy can increase each year. This law requires that school districts submit to the state controller, the commissioner of education, and the commissioner of taxation and finance any information necessary for calculating their tax levy limit for the coming school year no later than March 1st. The controller has developed web tool that will allow districts to satisfy this reporting requirement via a single online submission. Based on the information and guidance available at this time, the 2015-16 levy limit for Penfield has been calculated as set forth in your agenda. 
So we resolve that the Board of Education of the Penfield Central School District hereby approves the submission of the tax levy limit of $59,945,869 as calculated in accordance with guidance set forth by the State Controller, the Commissioner of Education, and the Commissioner of Taxation and Finance. This tax levy limit represents an increase of 2.41%. And be it further resolved that the tax levy limit plus all exclusions as set forth in the law is hereby established at $59,945,869. This maximum levy increase after exclusions represents an allowable increase of 2.41%. May I have a motion, please, that this resolution be approved? Second. Questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. Renewal of contract for Delphi Drug and Alcohol Council. The district contracts with Delphi for the provision of two substance abuse counselors, with one counselor located at the high school and one split between the four elementary schools. This contract has been in place for a number of years, and it is recommended that we renew it. Resolved that the Board of Education authorizes the Superintendent of Schools to finalize contract terms and enter into a contract for services with Delphi Drug and Alcohol Council for Substance Abuse Counseling and Education Services for the 2015-16 school year at a cost of $65,400. So moved. Questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. We have policies that are here for review. Uh, we start with the policy that is here for first reading, 8272 for district website and regulations. Catherine. Okay, so for um, the website and regulations, um, just note the underlined bold print. The wording added is, or mobile device applications which can include Infinite Campus, Engage New York, Meal, uh, meal Pay, et cetera. In the regulations of the same policy, um, the changes are the ones that have been crossed out. So we did some, there's been some deletions there. Then in um, the second read for the visitors to the school, which has been presented um, a couple of times prior, um, I just wanted to explain that the purpose of the policy, which is not a new policy, is to cover use of the new electronic visitor system that is uh, being implemented. Um, and that adds a new level of knowing who is in the school building. The wording of the policy covers most scenarios. However, the regulations have a more thorough explanation of the various multiple times when we do not use the new system. Page 14 of the regulations explains use and non-use of the system, specifically for organized groups uh, visiting during the school day, and use of the system specifically for organized group groups visiting during the school day. Oh, I'm sorry, repeated myself, um, after school. So during and after school. And then page 15 explains the privacy and the data security. And I wanted to note that we are going to revisit this again in February of 2016. Great. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I need to note that for the first reading, this policy will be on our website for the public to look at and comment if they would like to. Um, for the second reading, Dr. Putnam, have you received any comments from the public? Uh, we have not received any <clears throat> any comments from the public. I would just mention that uh, to the board that we did get comments on the first reading, so we've uh, moved those to our to our policy committee discussion, um, and we've continued to look at the uh, visitors to the school. I think um, Catherine did a nice job, sort of. We're, we're really in flux here with this policy. The policy is to oversee the visitors to the school or happen to be using this new visitor management system, which is an electronic system that we can use to really see who's in the building for uh, lots of different reasons, uh, primarily safety of staff and students. Um, 
but ultimately we do have some building autonomy around we're, this is going to be an influx on when we use it and when we don't so for example uh, mr turkowski was here earlier he presented to harris hill today i happen to be there and the uh, they have a veterans day celebration at harris hill and we would not use the scan-in system for that because you're talking about two to three hundred people all coming in at the same time um, but instead of using the scan system to have people come in um, it's a controlled process to bring everybody in and bring right to the auditorium. And so we know that we're going to run into more of those sort of as we work through it this year on when should we use it and when should we not use it. Just another example I know from a, a, a nearby district is they try to use it for any professional development. There are times that we hold professional development, for example, the Futures Project, where we're bringing people from all many districts into the school. And sometimes that can be a little cumbersome to try to do that but if there's a clear system and we know exactly where they're going and we're escorting those people to the professional development room, we might not want to use that. To try to put all that in the policy on when we are going to use it and when we aren't is too difficult. So we put it in regulation, which means when we want to try to um, more, make this more solidified, we can do so without having to go back to the board for a policy change, which is why those real specifics nitty gritty get into the regulation. Um, so again, I think the biggest piece for the visitor management system and the visitors to school is we noted in policy committee we're going to be reviewing it in February because it will be implemented in April uh, just to do sort of a, um, a soft opening for the, for the end of the school year. The beginning of the school year we're really going to get a lot of information and then the policy committee can review in february to say what do we need to change do we need to change the policy do we need to look at regulation more closely so all right thank you dr putnam yeah. any additional questions or comments thank you at this time board member it is important that we have a motion to approve policy 82 42 and 32 10 as uh, presented so moved Questions or comments? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. President's remark, I have sent you an email regarding the advocacy trip that is uh, uh, put together by Monroe County School Board. As of now, I have Camille going, John, Mark, myself, Tom. Am I missing someone? Okay. This. This is an exciting trip. It's a two-day trip with a lot of advocacy planned for us by the Legislative Committee. Thank you, John. Um, you know, and we are excited about it. Um, and this will be on March 23rd and 24th. Um, next item under President's remark is uh, a new section on our website. I, we keep on finding more work for Nancy. <laughs> And thank you for humoring us with everything that we try to add. So, um, you know, working with Dr. Putnam, we uh, have decided to add an advocacy page on our website and really just for sharing more information, trying to get the community more active uh, into anything where they can advocate for our students, for our schools, and anything that is good for, um, you know, our schools. So we have worked together on... Um, a letter and thank you so much for championing this because we've been wanting to have an advocacy letter for uh, an advocacy effort forever so uh, you know seeing this letter um, really is just it, it's it is exciting and knowing that you are going to share it with the community for to allow anybody from the community to advocate either by writing to their representatives or to the governor or you know depending on where they live in the five towns that we cover um, so, board members, you've seen the letter uh, that we uh, put together, and uh, you know, I know I've received some questions about why did you only pick three issues. Uh, there was so much more that we could talk about other than the GEA and you know this and that. Well, we did not want to dilute the whole message. There is definitely a long laundry list of things that we could uh, present to the community on what to advocate for, but um, you know, we just chose those three, not meaning to say that we cannot have more in the future. So any questions or comments? I would, I mean, if we're going to have an advocacy page, I imagine we'll have more advocacy letters coming yes. from my office. So, um, but I think, you know, the, the, uh, the governor's uh, given us a lot to advocate for. Oh, so yes. I think that that conversation with the public and the focus uh, that people see when we finalized a draft is really around around budget 
um, advocacy of the budget and sort of local control and, and having to sort of have our hands tied by Albany from a couple of different reasons. Um, there's some other things to advocate for. Earlier, I put a letter out to the community around field tests and um, the state looking to make field tests a mandatory as, as opposed to an optional um, opt-in. Uh, there is no decision yet from Albany. They had originally said they'd have a decision in February. They have wisely pushed that decision off till March, um, so we're waiting to see. Uh, but those letters uh, would also get moved to the um, advocacy page once we're once we're up. So um, hopefully, you know, the community can can take a look because we have a, obviously a, a very uh, uh, intelligent and well-informed community who's looking on um, how to communicate with Albany and um, you know how to reach out when when they are stressed with what they read in the paper in terms of uh, anything, uh, either budget-wise or educational-wise. So I think it's great. All right. Yes, John. And I know I say this all the time, but I think it's important that they hear from, you know, the grassroots yep. parents. Because um, we can go up there. We'll be up there for a couple of days, and uh, there'll be about 100 other groups up there on that Tuesday because that's going to be, like, the pinnacle of the year. But it's important, uh, again, when you receive some kind of communication from your state legislator and they're asking for comment, just fill it out and say we want full funding for Penfield Schools. And just getting that card back to them or an email makes it so much easier uh, for them to understand that it's just not us. They think we have a vested interest, but and we do, but they want to hear from more people. So it's just so important. And, um, and I'm glad, you know, having, I remember years ago, just being the only person on the bus trip. So I'm glad we've built up the interest and uh, that we're taking a more active role. And this page is going to just be tremendous. I think that is going to be great, and we will be sending it electronically to the whole community, not only to parents, so anybody who wishes to participate can do that, so we're pretty excited about it. Uh, you know, speaking of advocacy, uh, tomorrow is virtual lobby for New York State PTA, so any of our PTAs can log on to the New York State PTA website and find quite a kit there on how to be better advocates. So. Um, always important uh, information. And lastly, communication update. We've all received an email regarding Jody Siegel's resignation, which uh, Dr. Putnam and myself regretfully accepted with the executive committee last week at our meeting. And um, I don't know how we're going to find someone to replace Jody. Yeah, she's leaving very big shoes to fill, and uh, she's going to be missed. So if you have any comments in regard to this position um, that you would like to pass on to Mark Okanovich, uh, the president of Monroe County School Board, if you can do so by the end of this week, please, and we can pass that on uh, until the position is advertised and they start interviewing. So. All right, and that's it for President's remark. We have no unfinished business that I know of. So at this time, may I have a motion, please, that the meeting be adjourned at 9.37 p.m. Second. Questions or comment? Thank you. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you.